we're nearly at the end of our six Bhadamita series, and today we're looking at the fifth Bhadamita of meditative absorption, referred to as dhyana in Sanskrit. And Mahayana Buddhists really look at the path with um, you know, a much larger, wider view, looking beyond just this life. And the goal is to practice these perfections to perfection over many lifetimes. <clears throat> and as we're practicing the first two paramitas, uh, generosity and ethics, which are really about relating with others and the world, we see that we really need the third paramita of patience to keep developing those virtues in relating with others. And, and then we end up gathering and accumulating a lot of energy from all that effort. And that's where uh, the energy, the vidya or perseverance, the fourth paramita, uh, we can direct that energy towards meditation. And uh, not too long ago, Pinsukla taught a three-part series on shamatha. And shamatha is the preliminary to this perfection, dhyana. And there are four progressive levels of dhyana or absorption. And I think we've all experienced how challenging it is to achieve even just the preliminary that is shamatha. Um, so we're here to ask Pinsukla, how can we approach this fifth paramita of meditative absorption in a realistic, applicable, and encouraging way, uh, and fine tune our current meditation practice to make sure it's progressing in a, in a really beneficial way for us. Um, so Pinsukla, please. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm sorry that I'm late. Uh, as you can tell by the green screen, <laughs> I'm not in my new usual place. <laughs> okay, so I had to make do with uh, the place that I'm in right now. So thank you for joining. And this is very, uh, this topic, meditation, as all of you who've known me for some time now know that this is my like most favorite topic of all times. And uh, we did do a, uh, like an introduction to Shamata uh, some time ago. And uh, out of that, there was a request that there was, a, there was a, we had interest in, oh, can we go deeper into that? So I'm hoping that uh, we will be able to go deeper mm -hmm. into, this, into this. So mm -hmm. that's an introduction to tell you, we're not gonna go that deep <laughs> within an hour tonight. But what I want you to get out of it is uh, to be encouraged, don't be uh, scared by the word shamatha, samadhi, vipassana, all those beautiful foreign words, and especially the word concentration. It sounds like you know constipated or something. <laughs> I don't want to be constipated. I know I don't want to be. <laughs> so we want to get rid of the the scary, uh, scary. Uh, bad reputation that uh, this, this beautiful uh, path, this beautiful uh, topic has. And also to go for it in such a way that we can have a, oh, okay, now I understand. At least in some degree that uh, at least the initial levels of confusion that we have about this thing that prevents us from engaging it in a way that is sustained, that has, uh, that, that, that brings about fruit that we can actually begin to experience. So these levels of confusion at least can be uh, dealt with, okay? And especially with the terms themselves, okay? So we, that's what we're gonna go into. And sort of like a more of an overview of, of the meditation path and especially within the context of what we are talking about, the perfections. What, what is considered to be the perfection or the perfectioning of meditation. Okay? So there's the perfectioning of meditation. There's the perfected state of meditation. Okay. So how do we do that? All right, so we begin with, uh, since we don't have much time, we never have much time. <laughs> Give me five hours, it will not be enough. <laughs> find a way to drag it and make, make us come, make us uh, end up going over time, All right? So relatively speaking, we don't have enough time. 
<laughs> so we will not be uh, the meditation will not be too too much. We will not we will spend too much time in the meditation. Just maybe about ten minutes. Okay, ten minutes meditation. And again, I'm not going to guide you. We're going to do it exactly the same meditation that we did last time. And what we are going to uh, collect our attention towards is how energetically, energetically, what are we experiencing? Don't look for any specific meditation uh, energy. Don't look for light. Don't look for anything. Just as far as you understand of what energy is, what you felt energy is supposed to be, and just bring awareness to that. And as you allow your mind to settle into being aware of energy, what is happening to, to, to that experience itself? That's all you have to do, okay? And whenever you hear that's all you have to do, the danger is you might fall asleep. <laughs> there's no excitement, there's no trillion, billion visualizations to do. You know, there's no making up things. It's just being aware with what is as far as energy is concerned. Okay. Well, I'm gonna set the timer. For just 15 minutes. Okay, I will guide you in the very beginning just to help you settle in into it and then I'll leave you alone for about, let's make it a nice number, 11 minutes. <laughs> okay, what's 12, 13? Okay, all right, 11 minutes. All right, it will end up being a bit longer because I'm gonna guide you a little bit in the beginning. All right, what's the first thing you need to do? First thing you need to do is to consciously tell yourself, I am going to meditate. Allow the natural intelligence within the body, the natural intelligence within your being, in all the different ways that your being is expressed. Allow them to, ah, meditation. I know what that is. Let them communicate to you what you need to do. Let your body communicate to you. Oh, you want to meditate? All right, this is what you need to do. Put your legs like this. Put your back like this. Put your arms like this. And what you, while you're doing that, you're allowing yourself to begin to feel a degree of shamatha, a degree of calmness. We are returning to the, the mind to its natural state. So any sense of making contact with this natural state, you sort of hold your attention as much as you can on that. And what are the signs that you are approaching, uh, abiding in your mind's natural state? It will feel good, okay? You will have some nice feelings. You will feel a sense of stability in the body. You will feel a sense of calm. You will see, see, begin to feel a sense of clarity. You will begin to see, feel a sense of, of uh, luminosity, a sense of brightness in the mind. So that's, that's what we bring attention to that allow, that tells us, ah, oh, yes, I'm not just wasting my time here doing nothing. I'm actually meditating. And wherever you feel tension, just relax. If you can't feel relaxation, just hold on to the intention to relax the shoulders, the hips. You want to arrive at a place where the body is holding itself in its natural state so that the mind can be invited to enter in, into its natural state. And sometimes what I find to be a good way of making a transition from 
the state of not being in meditation and then entering the meditative state is to bring attention to the breath and deliberately take a deep breath and just be aware of the breath. And as I breathe out, I let go, 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 I allow, I allow, I allow. And that allows me to be able to make contact with the sense of calm, the sense of pleasantness in the body itself. Making that contact, I rejoice. Allows me to make contact with calmness, with pleasantness in the breath itself. Making contact with that, I rejoice. I allow myself to make, to be aware of the contact that I make with these qualities of calmness and pleasantness to whatever degree that they are present in what you might call purely mental calmness, purely mental kind of pleasantness, then I rejoice. And it's through making contact with those qualities in the mind we will begin to subtly be aware of some other qualities connected to them, a sense of clarity, not immediate clarity all at once, but something connected to clarity, something connected to luminosity, the vividness of the experience, the presentness of the experience, the distinctiveness of the experience, whatever it may be. And we rejoice. Now that we are witnessing ourselves approaching and abiding in something that we can call meditation or approaching meditation, we rejoice, let go. And if you wish, you can stabilize this with three full breath, consciously breathing in, consciously breathing out. And as you breathe out, let go. And witness yourself going deeper into these very signs, the calm, the pleasantness, the clarity, the radiance, the stability. Now we call your intention. Why are we gathering here? What purpose will it serve? What life purpose are we serving right here, right now? How is it gonna contribute in a way that is palpable, in a way that is actually effective? And whatever that's going to help you, whatever resources that you have within you, outside of you, even resources that have gone by, that have been exhausted, resources that you will encounter that you don't know yet, to all these resources that will help extend a sense of trust, gratitude. Respect. and begin to direct attention to energy. How are you in this very moment experiencing this term called energy? However you're experiencing it, then you have found your object where they, oh, it feels low, it feels excited, if you're distracted, however you're feeling it, then you have found it. You're not supposed to make it into something and then it becomes something that you can say, oh, now I'm meditating. However it is, you're aware of it, then you're meditating. Then just stay with it.
you may initially make contact with something that you thought was energy and later on discover that's not energy. That's good. You're able to make that discernment. It's just the heat in the room. It's not energy. It's not my energy. So let that guide you. Now that you are abiding, you've made contact with some degree of what you can call being aware of your energy, whatever it may be right now. As you are aware of it, as you are feeling it, as you are experiencing it in a way makes you feel that it is there, staying connected with it, 
directed towards healing. Whatever aspect of your life, your environment that needs healing, just as you are feeling the energy, just hold the intention, the thought, the wishes. Physical health, social health, health in how you're relating with others, health in how you are experiencing others relating to you. Just direct that, just hold that energy while you, your mind is bringing those thoughts in. And if you feel a natural radiation taking place, okay. You don't have to make it happen. You don't have to visualize it. Just feel what you feel is energy. And then as you feel it, bring those intentions, those wishes for health. And let the energy do what the energy feels it should do. Okay, get ready to come out of the meditation. Just become aware of just the meditative state itself. We're becoming aware of the qualities that makes, make it the meditation, the signs in the body, in the breath, in the mind, witnessing their presence, rejoice, And come out of the meditation, take a nice deep breath to reconnect. Uh, and gently allow your awareness to take in your immediate surroundings. Your sense of touch, sense of hearing, and sense of sight. Okay. I hope uh, we didn't lose too many people. 10 minutes of nothing, <laughs> Basic, seemingly nothing, but a lot of things was happening. I mean, you were focusing on energy that which makes things move. <laughs> okay. All right. Where do we begin? In the Lamrim Chenmo, Jason Kappa begins uh, the talk on uh, the perfection of meditation by describing what is meditation anyway. And when he's saying what is meditation anyway, here we are reading a translation and we see the word meditation. What word, what, what word is he actually using? Uh, Tibetans have different words for meditation but the general term that they use is uh, word, uh, is gomba, which means to habituate your mind, to become familiar with, okay? So that's what meditation, you could say that's the action of meditation. You're familiarizing your mind with something. 
And of course, we familiarize our mind with many things. So what distinguishes that from everyday ordinary familiarization of the mind? You know, some of us are very familiar with uh, Kim Kardashian's uh, fashion. <laughs> Is that meditation? <laughs> I mean, should I be saying these people's names? <laughs> uh, so to, they have to, then they further qualify by saying, by familiarizing the mind with what is virtuous. Virtuous meaning what actually benefits your mind for becoming familiar with that, familiar, be, making the mind becoming familiar, accustomed with it. Okay? That's the general term of meditation. Now, since this is coming from a Sanskrit tradition, it's not the it's not uh, gompa that they, the Tibetans are referring to when they refer to the perfection of meditation. What they're referring to is a Sanskrit term, which is very confusing because so many different traditions in in in, uh, in Sanskrit use it. Hindu or yoga uses it. Uh, Jains use it. Uh, Sikhs use it, all those different traditions coming out of that kind of tradition, they use the term. And it is something similar to meditation, but they have a slight difference on, on, on its usage. The word that is used is dhyana. Okay? Dhyana paramita. Not samadhi paramita, not shamatha paramita, but dhyana paramita. And then the word dhyana itself, yes, it is found across, uh, uh, across disciplines. It is found across the uh, traditions, but they have slightly, yes, it is connected to meditation, but they have a slight different understanding of it. And so most of us here in the West are familiar with, uh, with yoga. And one of the, uh, uh, you may have encountered it in the yoga, in the yoga traditions, specifically, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, uh, where the word dhyana comes in there. In uh, you know the the, uh, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali is basically presenting uh, eightfold. It's like an eightfold step, right? Beginning with uh, what you call that? Uh, do's and don'ts, and then uh, yama, niyama, things like that. Uh, uh, and then you have, well, anyway, <laughs> this is not a, a teaching on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, but towards the end, <laughs> you have where meditation comes in, right? You have, yeah, asana and, you know, all those things. Uh, then right, right before, uh, the, when you made meditation proper, you have uh, pratyahara, which is holding, uh, uh, withdrawing the senses. Your senses are no longer directed towards outside. They are being drawn within. That's pratyahara. So they have a specific, so that has a, its own category of practice. And then they have dharana, which is like focusing the mind. And probably you've encountered uh, one of the uh, methods that is used to achieve dharana or concentration, what is translated as concentration is like focusing on a on the light on the flame of a of a candle okay right. and the, the main purpose is to just focus it doesn't really matter what you what you are focusing on as long as you achieve focus then after that then comes dhyana and dhyana is meditation and this is where it's going it is going to start to get confusing for us especially those of us who are already familiar with these terms. So we have to understand, okay, within the Hindu, Hinduism context, these have these slight uh, differences in meaning. And when we are, when, when we are talking with Buddhists, we understand that these have these different kinds of, of meaning, subtle differences in meaning within the Buddhist context. So dhyana is the seventh, and the very last, which is considered the highest, that's what they call samadhi. And probably you even heard that when a, a great uh, teacher within the yoga tradition 
uh, achieves what they, what, what they call, call enlightenment, they call it, this person has achieved samadhi. And I remember uh, way, way, way back then, there was this great teacher, uh, Ramakrishna. I don't know if it, any of you have ever heard of him, Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna uh, was such a realized being that every once in a while, he would be, you're talking to him, you ask him, what would you like for dinner? And as he was saying, I want, and then he's, 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 he's like this. <laughs> and then he just simultaneously, uh, uh, what's that word? Uh, without, without wanting or interest into a, a, a trans state, samadhi. And because he's like this, the only reference we have in the West for the, when we see that, say, oh, that person is in a trance. And that's when, that's why the word trance is sometimes used. I think it's a very old way of, of, of referring to it, but, but uh, maybe once, uh, some people once in a while nowadays, they use that term too, okay? And, and what is it that they refer to as a samadhi? And it, for them, it is an, it's the achievement. And because it is the same Sanskrit word, so you could say they are taking meaning of the word to apply it to something. And in Buddhism, they're taking meaning of the word to apply it to something, okay? The, the, the main thing about samadhi is just like that person is absorbed in something, right? So that the, the, the sense of being absorbed, that's what samadhi is about. So within Hinduism, and this, is, and, and this is, I'm just throwing that out so that we can begin to get rid of the confusion. And it's, sometimes the confusion is not so much that it is the wrong interpretation, it's, it's more the wrong context, okay? Samadhi in Hinduism is a high state of achievement where what is it that they're trying to achieve in Hinduism? They want to unite the individual with the Supreme. And perhaps they use different terms uh, uh, for that, but something, some, something along that line. So when the individual personality is absorbed in some sort of supremeness with Brahma, with Shiva, with Supreme Atman, when that unification takes place, that is called Samadhi, okay? And also they use that term to refer to a highly realized being who has achieved enlightenment. And also when they have passed, when they have, let's say, uh, uh, no longer in use of their physical body, okay? We, we use a gross term death, <laughs> okay? When they die, then they say that person has entered great samadhi, the great samadhi. So the great absorption. So that person is not fully absorbed into the supreme. Okay, that's why they call it the great samadhi. Okay. Now, that's within the Hindu context. Now, the thing is that it has the term samad absorption in it. So how do the Buddhists use that part of the word samadhi absorption for, 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 uh, with, uh, for, for their path? So within Buddhism, the term samadhi is like an, an umbrella. When you are trying to absorb your mind in whatever, that practice itself is samadhi. When you have achieved some degree of union, degree of absorption with whatever, that state is called samadhi. And there are different levels of absorption depending on the subtlety of what it is that you are absorbed in. So when you are, uh, yeah, in, in the, within the Theravadan tradition, they have that term. I'm sure they have it also in the Mahayana and tradition, but I've not encountered it within the Mahayana. But if you're in a movie and you're completely absorbed into the movie, that is called a worldly samadhi. Okay, why is it worldly? It's not really gonna help you. <laughs> Unless it's a very good movie, you know, there's some very important message for you. But if it's just entertainment, it's not gonna do much for you. So you absorb yourself into just samsara, okay? And the reason I'm using the, the movie thing is that to understand when we, when you are 
approaching it from the, oh yeah, the mind is absorbed into some extremely in incomprehensible state called divine. Oh my God, that is out of my reach. How, how can I reach that? I cannot reach that. So it seems like absorption is something that is out of, out, of, out of reach, but absorption is something that we experience, unfortunately, unconsciously, spontaneously. When we are very interested in something, we achieve some kind of absorption. We forget ourselves. There's only the thing itself, the experience itself. That is samadhi, okay? So any level of absorption, whether it is a worldly absorption or whether it is if there are various degrees of subtlety of absorption, they all fall into samadhi within the Buddhist context. Now, don't go argue with a Hindu saying that, sorry, you have the wrong definition of samadhi, <laughs> okay? And within that umbrella of samadhi comes all the other terms that we associate with. We have, unfortunately, we have just one word, meditation, okay? You have uh, um, various degrees of uh, shamatha. Shamatha is, is another uh, 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 foreign word, Sanskrit, and it is referring to what? It is referring to simply calming. The mind is calm. Why is it calm? The noise of our afflictions have been quiet or quiet, have been quieted. Because of that, the quieting of the affliction, remember they are quieted, they're not destroyed, they're not removed, they're simply quieted. And because of that quiet, so it's called the quiet state. <laughs> Quietness, calm, okay? And to be able to enter that state at will. That's what the term shamatha is used for. Yes, we have experienced certain degrees of calm here and there, but they're not called shamatha because it's not something that we can uh, enter at will, okay? So the practice of being able to get into that quietness, that calm, that, it's, that you could say that person is practicing to achieve shamatha. And sometimes they call it shamatha practice, okay? So you're trying to get to shamatha and that practice is called shamatha. And uh, I'm gonna do one of those pretend things also, <laughs> I've done them. And you see advertisement for them, shamatha retreat. <laughs> okay, shamatha retreat. And then the, as if from the, from the moment you, get, you come in, they're gonna say, well, here's shamatha, stay with it for five, for, for, for five days. Uh -uh. It's basically, it is a practice that if you keep doing it over a period of time, you will eventually arrive at a calmness. You will arrive at a, at a point where your, uh, the afflictions, the worries, the fears, all these things that disturbs our mind, are quiet, are made quiet. And that quiet state itself is called shamatha. Uh, it's like the, the, uh, the analogy that I use a lot of times when you go into a space, you simply remove the clutter. What, what are you left with once you remove the clutter? That's what we're referring to as shamatha. But unfortunately, you, we put the clutter in the closets, <laughs> and they're bursting and then they burst the door and then they come back into the room, we collect them all and put them in there again. We're supposed to take them out. So Shamata doesn't take them out, Shamata just put them in the closet until you have to open the closet to get the, the golf club and then everything falls on top of you. <laughs> okay. So that's what the term Shamata refers to. Refers to. Now, uh, you've probably uh, have heard that there are various stages of experience that we go through to achieve what is referred to as shamatha. That is consciously, willfully entering shamatha. Uh, going through those stages 
get you closer and closer and closer. What is that what's happening? You're quieting your mind more, you're quieting your mind more, you're quieting your mind more. And eventually your mind is very quiet. And that's shamatha. This shamatha, right before you achieve it, is called preparation to enter dhyana. Once you achieve it, it's called now you have access to the door <laughs> to enter dhyana. Okay. So you could say shamatha is included within what within Buddhism they refer to as dhyana. So once, once we have a certain degree of stable absorption, stable absorption, you're able to enter that absorption and stay and maintain that absorption, that is referred to as dhyana. Okay. And the reason that I have to throw a Sanskrit terms at you is because we don't really have equivalents in English for, for them. We only have just meditation. Okay. That's why when you are looking for uh, the perfection of meditation, the, 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 the English translation for what is referred to as the, the, the perfection of meditation, the fifth paramita, you will come up with different kinds of translations. They're not all, they're not like one of them is wrong or one of them is better than the other. I mean, it all depends on what gives you the better feeling, okay? So some call it meditative stability, meditative absorption, meditative quietude, okay? All, some even call it the meditation, uh, meditative concentration. Okay, so don't be worried about the English terms themselves, but to understand what they mean by dhyana. Dhyana is achieving a stable level of absorption. And there are different levels of absorption. And the more refined, what, is, what does it mean by the more refined? The, the more of the gross aspects of mind that you're able to quiet down what you might call the, the subtle afflictions. Okay. So shamatha quiets the gross afflictions. Dhyana quiets a degrees of the subtle afflictions. Okay. And when you're able to enter into a definite state of absorption where a more subtle level of uh, you've sort of quieted, able to subdue a more subtle level of affliction, then that's a, a, another degree of dhyana, an, a higher level. And why do you want to reach higher degrees of, of dhyana? What's the whole purpose of achieving of meditation in the first place? It is to make the instrument that is capable of seeing reality as refined as possible. So that when it encounters reality as it is, a trans definite transformation can take place. That's the whole purpose. So the more subtle, the deeper the meditation, the more immediate, the faster, the more powerful the transformation. So shamatha, after, so if let's say you're meditating to get rid of, of uh, some, some definite affliction, and you're, you somehow you're able to achieve shamatha, and you keep going back to shamatha, going back to shamatha, and you and you, and you do the work. And I, that's why I love within the Theravadan tradition they call the meditative states the workshop. Okay, you don't just go into the meditative state and then that's it. Your job is done. Now your job starts. Now you start to work on bringing the mind out of its chaos. What is it? What are the things that is creating chaos in the mind. What are the things that is continuously creating the troubles that we, that we are experiencing and making us continuously engage in creating our own suffering, our own problems. So if, if you're doing the work within shamatha, it will take a bit of a time, <laughs> okay? So you could be working on one thing and then you're able to chisel a little bit of, of it away with, with shamatha. But if, you're able to, if you are able to enter jhana, then your mind becomes more powerful and you're able to take away a bigger chunk. 
So instead of taking, let's say, just for the sake of uh, giving a, 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 a time, just to be able to be able to understand it, if it would have taken one month to do the work in Shamata, it will take like a week or in one session, you can do the work in a dhyana, okay? Okay, so that's the reason for the different levels of dhyanas. It's not simply for um, showing off to yourselves. <laughs> okay. uh, all right. Now, uh, so we, we made that distinction between uh, shamata, dhyana, and samadhi. And there are some other words that are thrown at you also, especially certain, uh, certain traditions decide to call themselves by one of these terms, and then it confuses people even more, okay? Like, for example, vipassana, okay? Vipassana is a kind of meditation. And very nicely put in the, uh, the chapter on meditation by Master, uh, Master Shantideva, in that chapter, uh, he says, shamata, is the basis to be able to succeed with vipassana. And this is how it's understood within Mahayana traditions, okay? So actual vipassana is a kind of shamata, okay? That's what vipassana is. And what, what makes shamata and vipassana different is that uh, what work are you doing with that shamata. If your work is to come to become acquainted with reality as it is, that work is called vipassana. To put it in words, in terms that you are familiar with, when you are meditating to get wisdom, <laughs> okay, that's vipassana, okay. But keeping the mind undisturbed, undistracted, that's shamata. So that's the difference between vipassana and shamata. Now, there are traditions that call themselves vipassana and they give all kinds of meditations. And it seems like then every meditation is vipassana. But it's not, that, that, that's not the actual use of the term within, within, at least within the Buddhist context. And def definitely we're gonna uh, bring this to how does, Okay, what does this have to do with me? <laughs> okay, don't worry, we'll get to that. Okay. And we have, um, uh, uh, this is more of the, the translation of in, in the English as we main, we've lost this, whatever the Sanskrit may have been. Okay, mindfulness. And, as, and also confuses people it seems like mindfulness is every meditation that you do is mindfulness. Okay. Now, remember the Eightfold Path? Uh, the last of the uh, eight, Eightfold Path is correct samadhi, correct meditation. And what makes a meditation correct? It that it is, it, uh, it is, directing itself to, towards achieving dhyana, okay? And what are the prerequisites for correct meditation? That comes before correct mindfulness. So that tells you, even within the Eightfold Path, there's a dis definite distinction made with meditation and mindfulness. But and, 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 and how do they uh, support each other? You need mindfulness to be able to achieve samadhi, to be able to achieve dhyana, to be able to achieve shamatha. You need mindfulness. So mindfulness is a necessary component. It is something that you're doing in meditation. And if you take that component, it's not just when you're uh, sitting down, you're, you're practicing your mindfulness to help you with your meditation, but as you go on on your daily life, whatever is going on, 
you become aware of it. That is practicing mindfulness. And what are the things that are always going on with you? You don't have to go to the store to go look for something to be mindful of. Your body is always with you and it's always doing something to be aware of what the body is doing, how the, where the body is stationed, what is happening with the body, that is mindfulness. And being aware of that as it is happening will lead to definitely helping us achieve shamatha. And after we achieve shamatha, we'll be able to achieve the dhyanas. All that is practicing of samadhi. Now that we've done away with the, the terms, and I hope some of the confusions are removed, and in what subtle ways um, we've uh, uh, used and understood within within the Tibetan within a Buddhist tradition. Okay. Now the perfection of meditation itself. What is going on? There are these natural things happening all the time. Ignorance is being unaware of what, how are these things, how are these experiences uh, uh, taking place? It's unaware of what, what, what is it that is at the, uh, what is it that is at the foundation of these experiences? What makes certain experiences become experiences? What makes certain experiences continue to, to, have, the ex, to have the sense of continuing? It is tapping into this very process, this very dynamic of reality, consciously tapping into it. That's what you could say is the path. Okay. Consciously tapping into these natural occurrences, just like the Eightfold Noble Path, for example. If you remove noble out of it, just call it Eightfold Path, then what is it, what is it that it's presenting to you? It's presenting whatever you have in your life, that's, these are the steps that brought it, brought it about. Okay. You're obsessed about something, the obsession does something to the, uh, something to the chemicals in your brain gives you some kind of experience, okay? If what you obsess about is something that is unhealthy, of course, you will, not, you will, not, you will have disease. If what you obsess about is something healthy, then you will have health. Obsession is the key to both. So in the same way, if we understand, take responsibility for whatever our experience of reality is. And by responsibility, it doesn't mean blame yourself. Okay, that doesn't help. It means to understand that the power that is driving my reality, I have a connection to it. And I'm saying you have a connection to it because I don't wanna uh, scare anybody. I don't wanna you know, shush anybody who have specific ideas of what that's supposed to be. So I'll just say connection. <laughs> And, and does it really matter and that we have a connection to it, that we are able to exert influence on it is something that everyone accepts. Everyone accepts that they can exert influence on reality. They have different ways of approaching that. If I'm convinced that you are responsible for what I'm experiencing, then the way for me to change that is to go to you and plead with you, can you make some change here? I, I, in this case, I'm believing I'm able to persuade you. I have the power to persuade you, which I believe you are the cause of my experience. So somehow I believe I can affect my reality. Okay, I have to flatter you. I have to buy you gifts. I, I have to do something. And I believe by doing it in a certain way, I can affect my reality. So it is that same concept, that same conviction, you could say, that 
unfortunately drives people into different directions, but it's the same thing. I can change my reality. I have the capacity to affect how my reality is experienced. And if you also sort of like scientifically, okay, I'm, it sounds like I'm being biased by, by saying scientifically, okay, throw away the word Buddhism out of it, away from it. But if they just, just say, if we just sort of look at it on a scientific basis, somehow look at reality scientifically, we will see that, ah, what I am experiencing that is in Buddhism referred to as samsara, also it's some term samsara is also in Hinduism, also in Jainism. So it's not just a Buddhist monopoly on the term, okay? So basically the experiences that we have that we wish we were not having, okay? That's samsara, whatever it may be. Oh, the burden of living in a castle. Oh my God, that's my samsara, okay? <laughs> Right? Oh, my shack, how beautiful. That's my nirvana, <laughs> okay. Right, so it doesn't really matter, right? So samsara uh, is whatever that you're experiencing that you wish that you were not experiencing when you're, as you're experiencing it, right? When you look at it, almost as if you look at the, what are the scaffolding? What are the things that are propping up samsara. And that's what the Eightfold Path is telling us. And meditation, the term absorption, and we go, we go back to it now, okay? The term absorption, you can say, we are absorbed in our afflictions. Because we are absorbed in our afflictions, we are experiencing what it is to be absorbed in our afflictions. We are absorbed in that our fears are real, our anxiety, our depression, our, uh, all these things, uh, they are real. We are absorbed into believing that they are real. And because of this absorption, so you say we are, we are in samadhi with samsara. We are absorbed in samsara. Okay. And it is not that we have to stop the process of absorption but rather we have to direct this power of absorption in a different direction. And what is keeping us from directing this power of, that is already within us, the power to be absorbed in the direction that is actually good is for our health? What is keeping us from that? That's what Shantideva, Master Shantideva says in the very beginning of the chapter on meditation, the fangs, of distraction. We are masters of the, of the experience called distraction. And because we are masters of the experience of distraction, it has become automatic. It has its, we've given it automatic energy. We've taken our capacity to our connection to, to infinite energy and we pass it on to distraction. Now, did we do it because, oh, look at distraction. This bliss is, uh, this bliss is getting boring. Let me get some suffering. <laughs> okay. Nobody, nobody in the entire universe has ever made such an intention. Okay. Even, yeah, then you might say, what about the, what's called those people? Masochists? Masochists who seem to go after pain, they're not going after pain, they're going after pleasure. They get their pleasure through what you see as what would be new pain. That's, they're going after pleasure. Do you think they're going after pain? No, they're going after pleasure, okay? So they're not thinking, oh, let me make myself suffer. All right. The energy, the capacity of absorption is already within us. We've just misdirected them. Knowing that we misdirected them tells us that we don't have to go out of ourselves to find the energy. It's already here. We are using it already. We've created this beautiful thing called samsara with it. We are keeping up samsara with it. We are perpetuating samsara with it. 
And how do we perpetuate this thing called samsara? We've added something called distraction. Now, knowing that that's where we've directed th that, then what we need to do is now acknowledge I have that power, I have the capacity of absorption, and do not be discouraged when you are witnessing your power. What, what do I mean? Do not become discouraged when you're witnessing your power. Ah, oh, I don't like this samsara thing. Okay, let me direct it towards Nirvana. Where's Nirvana? Is Nirvana not here yet? I, I don't want samsara anymore. Come on, Nirvana, come. And there you are still in samsara. What are you witnessing? You're witnessing your power to keep yourself in samsara. That's how powerful you are. Even though you don't want to experience samsara at some level, you're still able to keep yourself there. So, that, so you're witnessing your power as you begin to direct energy towards meditation, towards directing absorption into something else, something that is wholesome, something that's actually healthy for you. You would encounter resistance and resistance is your own resistance. It is simply, that something, simply something that we have set up. Now here is something that we need to understand about distraction. Distraction, believe it or not, is because we, are, we have deluded ourselves so well, we are trying to reach nirvana, but because we are deluded, we keep going looking for, for nirvana. So you could say distraction is the habit of constantly looking for nirvana where nirvana doesn't exist. Where, doesn't it, where is it that it doesn't exist? Outside of you. And because this has been given power to be automatic, when we are trying to do, redirect our mind, of course, you're gonna be, hey, you told me to keep looking for Nirvana. I'm gonna keep doing that. And you have to begin to pull back. That's pratyahara, pratyahara. That's pratyahara, calling back. That's what it's called withdrawing, taking back the energy that we've given to our capacity to be distracted. It's not gonna happen overnight. We're gonna slowly withdraw it. How do we slowly withdraw it? Convince ourselves that the nirvana we are looking for is not gonna be found outside. I don't care how long you're gonna be meditating for, decades, until you achieve some level of conviction that nirvana is not to be found outside, you're gonna be wasting your time, wasting your energy. And that is why we do not make progress because we have not convinced ourselves that stopping what we are used to is actually gonna bring some kind of something that we actually want. We're not convinced yet. So we become addicted to distraction because we are convinced Nirvana is out there and we begin to withdraw that, our attention from that. And what is, what? What are some examples of distraction? I'm not talking about you only when you're meditating and then the, the garbage, track, garbage truck go by and then, ah, I'm distra distracted. No, that's too easy. What is distraction? You're angry and refuse to know that you're angry. What, are you, what do you do when you're angry that you're distracting yourself? You start yelling. Why are you yelling? You're distracting yourself from the feeling, the emotion that you're angry. The angry is telling you something. A, you convinced me that this situation is dangerous and I'm telling you, we've I've encountered danger. The thing to do is to say, oh, where's the danger? That's being with it. That's not being distracted. Yelling, shouting, doing all kinds of things other than just being aware that you're angry, that is a distraction. And you're thinking that sitting down, meditating and then the garbage truck is passing by, oh, I have to do, practice better so I can not be distracted. But if you cannot be with your anger when you're angry, the garbage truck is gonna be the least of your problem of being distracted, okay? That's not, that's not where your distraction is coming from. Whatever is going on, 
to know that it is going on as it is going on. Now, don't you age don't you age this, <laughs> please, <laughs> with, oh, that means whatever is going on, be okay with it. No. Why are we on the path in the first place if we're going to be okay with everything? Be okay with samsara? No, don't be okay with samsara. But be aware that there is samsara. That is the path to get out of samsara, to be aware that there is samsara in the first place. Yeah, this sucks. How does it suck? Tell me how it sucks. If you cannot tell me how it sucks, you have no idea that it sucks. How can you know that it sucks? I feel this in my legs. I feel this in my, my body. I feel this in my mind. I feel the urge to do this. I feel this and that. That's what's present. And all these things are uncomfortable. That's how you know it sucks. And now that you know it sucks, you will definitely want to get out of it. How am I propping this up? How, what is it that I'm absorbed in that is holding this up? In where have I directed my capacity to be absorbed that is creating this experience? Right? So, basically, the training of samada, uh, samadhi. Uh, samadhi, by the way, uh, sam means to collect, right? So you see, pratyahara, taking your senses in, start, start making them go out. And they only, they only go out because you're there. There is conviction within you that is to be found outside. So when you're meditating, when you're sitting down and you witness yourself being distracted, what, what, what should you, what, what is it that, that will help you with your meditation? What conviction do you have in that thing that it is good for you? I'm not talking about your, 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 you, know, you have a conviction that it is ice cream. I'm talking about even if anger distracts you, it distracts you, that means it's because somehow there's a conviction by going into it, it will, I, will, I will benefit somehow. It doesn't make sense, but that's what's happening. That is the mechanism of why anger is capable of distracting you. We give it the power to do so. And it's simply exercising its power that we have given it. Okay. What will help collect the mind? What basically, what will help collect attention, awareness, which is some, the sum of samadhi, what will help collect attention? Collect it from being scattered all over the place. Being interested. Being interested. And being interested can be something that you, that you make yourself become interested. You think all the things that you're interested in, you were born interested in them? You made yourself interested in them. So the same power that allows you to become interested in whatever, you can use that a power to become interested in something that you have, we have somehow come to uh, give your conviction is for our own benefit. And we keep going back to it, going back to it, going back to it, going back to it. This is part of the, the practice of diligence. Convince this is good for me. And we keep repeating connection to it. That's the repetition, 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 repetition. And eventually it creates a groove of joy. And what is that joy coming from? We are slowly removing the things that is not part of our, 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 of our nature. And we're taking joy in doing it. And because we're taking joy in doing it, and eventually the mind will say, ah, there's joy here. I don't have to go outside for joy anymore. Let me see how much more joy I can get here, then that's when the mind will begin to collect, go back in. It must, the mind must connect with joy. What, do I, what does that mean? The mind must be made to connect with what it thinks is outside, but makes connection with it inside. Then that conviction of going outside for it will be, will, will, will lose its power. Then that same 
power that you were not able to, oh my God, I don't want to do this and here I am doing it. I'm being distracted. That same uncontrollable power, that same automatic power will be reversed. That's why Ramakrishna would be, <laughs> okay, it's reversed, okay? It's, it knows that the joy that it wants is not to be found outside, it's convinced. It has made contact with something within that is that has connected to the joy. So that conviction that the joy is within has been, is, has been properly created. And now it goes within. And what is it that we are doing with all this? And that's why the, uh, the, the subtitle of, uh, of, the, of the class is uh, restoring the mind. What we are seeking is not something that we're gonna make the mind become but rather what we are seeking is re restoring the mind to its natural state, restoring ourselves to our natural state of peace. That's why we're looking for it. That's why we are desperate for it. That's why we will do whatever when we are convinced that it will help us get there, okay? When we begin to make contact that it is within us, then, it, then meditation becomes easy. It's not, a, it's not a struggle anymore. It is only a struggle, first of all, because you're witnessing your power. Second of all, it is simply, we have invested our energy and it has become automatic. And we are convinced that what we're looking for is outside of us, outside of our minds. So that's what we have to undermine that conviction that it is outside of our mind. When you find yourself not able to meditate for a long time, address that. You're not really convinced that meditation will do for you what it's promising. Even though so many books have said it, so many people are saying it, in your, in, in our, in your deep within you, you have not presented evidence to yourself that convinces you. And that's what you have to ad address. That is your distraction, your lack of conviction. Address that. And once you are convinced, you will find yourself once being able to bear that, ah, oh, I'm not able to do it yet. But because your conviction, you will apply energy. You will be diligent towards getting back your sanity. Because you're convinced your natural state is sanity, not this craziness. Uh, I would, I mean, there are so many other things to talk about, but I think that's the, that's the main thing. Sorry, I didn't go into the nine stages of Shamatha. Sorry, uh, <laughs> those of you who are waiting for that. Uh, and uh, the hindrances, the obstacles, the eight, the seven, the five, the, the, the three of that. Sorry, all that is to, are guidelines, okay? When you are sitting down, okay, I want, to, I want to experience shamata, my mind completely divorced of the afflictions. And you sit down and what are you experiencing? What, are you, what is going on? What are you experiencing as you make that attempt? First, being aware of what is actually taking place. Oh, my mind is very distracting. What is it distracted to? It keeps thinking about that thing most of the time. It's because I'm convinced that thing somehow will help me. I'm not saying like anxiety, for example. I'm not thinking that anxiety will help me, but somewhere I'm convinced being anxious is somehow beneficial to me. That's why I'm able to continue to be anxious even though I don't want to be anxious. Okay, I mean, that's kind of a, a, a very superficial way of, of talking about uh, anxiety, but you get the gist of it. I mean, it's more, much more complex than that, but that's in a simplified way, that's what's going on. That's why a mind keeps going there in, in, in that way. 
Uh, so I didn't go into specific, you know, the, the things that you keep forgetting, <laughs> the list. <laughs> why, keep, why should I keep giving you the list when you're gonna forget it anyway? But the essence of the list is what is going on in your mind as you try to meditate. That's, your, that's whatever it is going on that is not shine itself, that is your, that is your hindrance, that is your obstacle. Make a list of them, okay? I don't have to give you a foreign list of things and you keep looking for them and you can find them and you have your own things to worry about, okay? The main thing is your mind is not at peace because it is actively engaged in creating chaos. It is actively engaged in creating chaos because it believes somewhere, convinced somewhere that chaos is what it needs. And, I, and uh, definitely, I would love to go deep into that so I can go into the vitaka, the vichara, <laughs> those terms, and then being able to apply them, make them make sense, uh, uh, a little, uh, I, love the, I, I love the topic of meditation, so I, I love reading about meditation. Uh, I started reading about Buddhist meditation from the Pali texts. You know, when I was very young, I, I, I didn't really have a tradition. I was just reading whatever called itself Buddhist. Then I would, I would, uh, uh, yeah, Bhavana. I, I, I would uh, read the Pali text on meditation. It seems to be so clear, so concise. But when it comes to certain terms, that are necessary for application, I'm, I'll advocate, I can't understand this thing, what they're talking about. I don't know how in my experience, I'm gonna encounter this experience that I need so I can move on. So I get stuck like Vitaka and Vichara. So far, I have not read that many texts that explains it, but they all seems to talk about it as if oh, we know what that is. Vitaka is uh, 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 applied thought. What is vichara? Vichara is, uh, you know, um, sustained thought. What does that mean? You know, when you apply your thought, you know, when you sustain your thought, what does that mean? I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> I mean, those are English words, but I've never put them together to make sense. So what do they mean? This is what they mean by applied thought and, be, and sustained thought. And when you understand it this way, then you will actually make progress. Basically, how do you talk to yourself in your mind? Take that towards the meditation. That's what they mean. Eventually, you will no longer need it, and then you, you, will, be, you will not need it anymore. But in the beginning, you need to tell yourself, that's what, that's, you could say, in a sense, that's what mantra does. It is telling yourself, breath, 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 breath. It helps you connect your mind to the breath. And there's an experience that we have once we feel the mind is on the breath. There's a mental feeling. So we try to hold on to that. That's what, the, that's what they're referring to, those two things. And a very gross way is, am I aware of the breath? Oh yeah, I'm aware of the breath. Am I aware of the breath? Oh yeah, I'm aware of the breath. That's Vitaka and Vichara, okay? So being aware of what's going on, are you, are, you, are you aware of what you're supposed to be aware of? And yes, and that's holding it. That's Vitaka and Vichara. And there are other things like that. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this very last thing and then, and then leave. And now, when you come to the Tibetan tradition, the Mayana tradition, they don't talk about the dhyana much. In the Theravadan tradition, they talk a lot about the dhyanas, right? Which is, and all Buddhists recognize them to be higher levels of, 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 of absorption, of meditation. In the Tibetan tradition, they call more, they, they make an emphasis on shamatha. And mainly because shamatha is, if you, you could say dhyana is a kind of shamatha. The dhyana is a kind of shamatha, right? So they talk more about achieving shamatha. 
And then when they give you the uh, explanations of how you, how you do it, it, and a lot of it makes seem to make sense. Sometimes when you're trying to apply it, the understanding goes out the window, <laughs> okay? And now when it comes to, uh, sorry, as far as I'm concerned, probably because I don't speak Tibetan, I'm, I'm not within the Tibetan uh, culture of understanding the language, right? Uh, when it comes to reading what the Tibetans say in reference to how to develop dhyana, oh my God, I'm reading English and I swear I don't understand English. The words that I encounter, it's like, it's like they're punching me. Why are you looking for dhyana? Get out of here. <laughs> Oh my goodness. It's like, you want, you want to know, you want Diana? First go to Mars. <laughs> Make a left on, on, on Jupiter. <laughs> and when you get to the asteroid, you will find Diana. Okay? It seems because of the term that they use, right? But uh, basically just understand it that way, okay? Yeah. Divorce your mind from your afflictions. And what's the best beginning way of divorcing your mind from your afflictions, watch your behavior. Watch your behavior. Make sure your behavior is wholesome. It's not gonna be wholesome all the time. I didn't say make your behavior wholesome, no matter what. I'm saying watch your behavior. And you yourself will discover, ah, this is not he healthy. This is healthy. And you will naturally go towards the direction of what's healthy and what's not, and stay away from what's not healthy. And that will help the mind to gradually be able to get to shamatha. If you don't take care of these seemingly worldly, non-related things, there's no way we're going to get to shamatha. You're going to be in a cave for 20 years trying to get to shamatha. All you will get is frustration. Okay. <laughs> And the most important thing about achieving shamatha is we have to practice every day. Yes, we have to practice every day. And before you make any, uh, before we make any promises that we cannot keep, don't say I'm going to practice every day now at five o'clock in the morning every day. Don't do that. First, become interested. Ah, this thing I really, I'm really interested in. I really would like to get into it. And let that interest itself pick a time. Okay, all right. You say do it every uh, uh, every every Monday at uh, five o'clock in the morning. Okay, all right. I'll uh, let you let you guide me. This <laughs> interest in being interested. Okay, and that way you don't make a promise and then witness yourself breaking your promise and you become discouraged, which is the number one enemy of the path. All right, sorry, I didn't go into the very scholastic way of dealing with meditation. You can read those things and, and let yourself be confused nicely, properly. <laughs> okay. But I hope uh, some of the confusions are removed and a sense of, ah, I think I can, I think I, I can get myself to do that has been uh, uh, a win within you. All right, I'm sorry, like I said, give me five hours, I will still go over time. And I did go over time. So thank you for your patience, for practicing the perfection of patience with me. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Ponsa. Thank you, Ponsa. Oh, thank you. Oh, are we ending here? Yeah, we are ending here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Should have ended uh, a little bit while ago, but. Let us know when you schedule that five hour class. We're ready for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for attending. So I'm gonna uh, lead us to a meditation very briefly, not as long as we did before, but it's gonna be guided, just the, 
usual that we've been doing lately. So oh, do, does anyone have any questions? Uh, I think Dion had a question. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Sorry about that. Yes, Dion, would you like to ask yourself on, on video? No, she would not. <laughs> what, you want me to read it out loud or you want to address it another time? You want me to read it? Uh, we can do the meditation. Okay. okay. Thank you. As you're settling, finding your posture so you can meditate, I will give you this little bit of, tiny bit of a thing from my retreat. Uh, what I, that, that's one of the kind of thing, that, that's one of the things that I realized in my retreat, in my previous retreat, is a kind of a conviction. Oh yeah, it is possible for regular folks like us to achieve shamatha. Okay. All right. Now that you are in your posture that is conducive to meditation, reconnect with the sense of being in meditation in the body, in the breath, in the mind, meditatively, energetically, mentally, noticing any signs that you are touching meditation, rejoice. And to help make the transition, you could take a nice deep breath And once you feel a sense of depth achieve, a sense of being deeper into what we are sensing as being the meditation, think of the presence of us. And as we think of us, feel that object, that sense of the reality that we feel as us. I give it a form, give it a bright brightness, a bright form and see it in the center of our circle that we are in a circle, even though we are in different places but somehow we are able to sit in a circle we are connected to each other through our hearts with a beam of light. And the beam of light connects, conjoins in the center of what is the sense of us. It gets brighter and as it gets brighter, it gets uh, wider, as it gets wider, it gets brighter. And as it gets wider, it transforms into itself, light, becoming us, becoming us your entire home, your entire neighborhood, your entire state, your entire country, the entire earth. You could stay there if you want, or you can even, if you want, if it's real for you, let it be the entire universe, whatever feels real for you. So the entirety of that is engulfed into this brightness and this brightness is us, it's us. Just like your body is us, your hand is ready to help the, your feet because your feet and your hand, hands, they, they are us. So we have that sense of we are ready to help the ocean. The ocean is us. We are ready to help the different species. They are us, the sky, the trees, our neighbor, they are us. Even people on different political views, they are us. And we feel ready to help them. They are us. And when that sense of us is very stable, so if we were in dhyana, we would have been absorbed into that and there would be nothing else in our mind but that sense of us. And keeping that sense of us, we move 
the prop of the visualized ball of light that is engulf everything. We no longer need it to feel that sense of us. So stay connected to that sense of us and that ball of light begins to shrink from the edge of the universe or from the edge of the planet. And it begins to shrink, shrink. And that sense of us is, is with us. Now we see the distinctive different things, the ocean, the trees, the different species of animals, different species of being, different neighbors, the trees, the oceans, even though we are seeing the distinct appearance, we still are able to maintain that sense of us. And it shrinks back to just being that ball of light in our midst. And then we feel ourselves feeding it. So we are making us and us is making myself by Taking care of us, I take care of me. By sincerely taking care of me, I'm taking care of us. And when that is stable, then we no longer need to see that little ball of light. It separates, becomes rays of light and dissolves, enters into each one of our hearts. And that conviction of us is still present and it's present within us as a glow that we emit. When I truly help me sincerely, I'm helping us. When I'm sincerely helping us, I'm also helping me. And get ready to come out of the meditation feeling that you are first actually in a meditative state, feeling the signs, whatever degree of calm, pleasantness, clarity, radiance, focus you're able to experience, let it give you the conviction and the joy that you are meditating, that you are in a sense experiencing a degree of your natural state, your mind to some degree restored. and take great joy and dedicate. Just dedicate to whatever is sincerely of a concern to you. And now dedicate in a general sense, towards everyone. Kewa di kyokun Sunam yeshe tzodzo shim Sunam yeshe le chung he Damba kunye topa And with joy, witnessing yourself in meditation, take, have the intention to take that joy with you outside the meditation. Intention to come out, take a nice deep breath, feel it, hear it. And deliberately reconnect with your immediate surroundings through your sense of touch, your sense of hearing, and your sense of sight. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. See you in about two weeks.